Welcome everybody. My name is Joe Delamore and I represent the Work That Reconnects Network. Thank you for joining us today for the Webinars and Conversation Cafe program, where we are providing a wide range of rich, educational, and supportive online events for our global Work That Reconnects community. Our intention is to strengthen the web of the community while reaching beyond its current edges to weave deeper connections with others who are contributing to the great turning in diverse and complementary ways. Today, we're very excited to be beginning this three-part series of webinars with Kathleen Rood, um, guiding us in a rich exploration of the skills and understandings necessary for facilitating effective and meaningful work that reconnects rituals. We'll be focusing our exploration today on the seventh generation practice. Kathleen is an experienced work that reconnects facilitator and mentor, a shamanic practitioner and an author. She is also one of the volunteer weavers for the work that reconnects network. And now I'm delighted to hand it over to Kathleen Rood. Great, thank you, Joe. And thanks so much for doing, um, holding us with um, all of your skills and tech support today. Thank you for that. And welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see um, old friends and new people here in this space. Um, and grateful that we have this opportunity um, to talk about and learn some more about um, how to offer these rituals in an effective way and, and be able to take each ritual one at a time. And so as Joe mentioned again, this is our time to be focusing in on the seventh generation ritual. And so before we get started, um, I'd like to get a sense from all of you here what your experience has been um, of this ritual. So Joe, if you could post, um, we have a quick poll and if you'll just, if you will indicate, um, fill that out so that I have a sense of experience. So that's okay. great. <laughs> All right, so over half of you, this is gonna be your first time um, experience this ritual. So um, how we're going to um, go about today or this evening, depending on where we're coming in from, um, I'm gonna do a, a grounding and just call us into our space together. Um, and then I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the different pieces of ritual and what we should, what we want to be looking for as facilitators um, going into this ritual. But then we're going to experience the ritual online. And it's clear that th this is gonna be a new experience for most of you to do the seventh generation online. And then after the ritual, so people can really have an experience of it, um, then we will do the debrief and talk more specifically about um, some facilitation um, aspects and, um, and then have plenty of time for questions afterwards. All right, so because I'd really like people to experience this, and I think you need to experience it before we can really get into some more of the facilitation specifics. Okay, wonderful. Let me, let me change my view here. Right. So let us now, as we're all settled into the space, um, ground ourselves and be able to create the container for the work that we're um, going to do in this ritual that we're going to experience. So I invite you to settle into your space. Close your eyes if that's comfortable, soft gaze. And just take a breath and arrive here in this time together. I want to ground ourselves in the space, in the land, in the country that you're in. And remembering that we are all beings of earth. I invite you to imagine that your energy can move down through the bottoms of your feet like roots of a tree and let your energy dance down through the soil, the clay bed, the bedrock, rooting you in earth, rooting you in the place that you are right now. And just like a tree, we can absorb the blessings of earth. Imagine this beautiful red light filling you with unconditional love and acceptance for who you are. 
filling you with Earth's abundance and creativity, diversity, and that's beautiful place of home, of sanctuary. Remembering that we are also beings of sky. Imagine now that your energy can move up through the crown of your head like branches of that tree, reaching high into the heavens. From there, breathing in the breath of life, the oxygen that kisses every cell awake. And here too, imagine these pulling in these blessings of sky as a blue light, filling you with vision, clarity, expansion, mystery, and protection. So now rooted in earth and breathing in sky, open yourself up to the, again, the land that you're on and the beauty that is there, the aspects of your place that bring you joy. And take that in. knowing that every land that we are on on this earth has been changed, that the earth, the planet from geologic time forward is always changing. But in this time of industrial growth, continuous industrial growth, we have changed this earth in so many ways and our societies and our peoples in so many ways. So bringing into your awareness now, connecting to the history and the current situation of the land that you're on and the ways that it has been changed in this great unraveling of war, conflict, oppression, extinctions, pollution, patriarchy, genocide, colonialization, hatred, disconnect, loss. Embodying the truth of the changes on your land. And know that you are not alone in this awareness in this heartbreak, in these challenges, and knowing that we are a part of this living, breathing body of earth, connected to all life, to all things, that in our energy fields, we are part of living systems. And so now I invite you to open up to all of the amazing work, realizations, ways of being that are bringing the great turning forward, all the things that are, you can experience in the place where you are. And then let that awareness of connection and interconnectedness, interbeing, move out from your place, connecting to everyone here in this Zoom experience across countries and oceans, and knowing that we are all connected that we are connected to all life on this planet. And feel that energy of the great turning moving through these systems and interconnections, new awareness, remembering of old ways. And then offering up, uh, gratitude and awareness for this beautiful going forth of choosing to be here in this moment, being surrounded by others, part of this work that reconnects community, bringing this work forward, your desire to participate and to share this beautiful ritual, going forth, taking this work out in the world. So grateful for all of you being here and for how you are. In this, in this great turning time. Thank you for being here and welcome. So we are here um, 
to learn about ritual and to learn about this ritual in particular. Um, and I will um, refer you to a webinar that we did back in October on um, effective rituals that goes into more detail. We're not, we're just gonna touch on it here today because we wanna focus on the experience of this ritual. But I'm putting in chat um, the aspects of ritual that I'm gonna invite you to um, tune into as we go through this ritual today. That every ritual um, has an intention. What is the purpose of the ritual? What are we inviting people into? Ritual by its nature um, is an experience of taking us out of ordinary time, ordinary reality, and allowing us to deepen into a new experience, to have, um, to, to open ourselves up to something either new or deep, um, connecting us in a different way, right? So we wanna be really clear about what is the intention of the ritual that we're doing so that we can guide um, how we facilitate it to bring that forward. And so we're gonna spend some time today talking about the, in, the intentions of seventh generation and the power of imagination and deep time. Every, um, every ritual, we wanna start with instruction. We want people to be able to understand very clearly what's expected, how the ritual is going to go. We want to get all the details out of the way so that people can be comfortable or at least as comfortable as they can be knowing, um, knowing what the, the guidelines are, the rules. And we, and we talk about rules as part of keeping a container. Because again, a ritual has a particular intention. And so we're going to set conditions, guidelines, rules that will allow people to have as much of that um, experience as possible. So we wanna be really clear with our instructions and make sure people are, are, don't have any more questions before we actually step in to the ritual space. So we're gonna have detailed instruction. Then there is the moving, transitioning from the everyday instruction into that ritual space. And how we move from that is really important to, to open our ritual and invite people in. Then there's the ritual itself. And where we as facilitators um, are holding that experience and wanting to ensure that um, the container remains strong. Again, that um, the guidelines that we've offered, people are following so that everyone can have um, the experience of the ritual as it's intended. Then we want to close the ritual and in, in often in the similar way that we began it. So every ritual has a very clear beginning, middle, clear ending. And then providing time for reflection. We don't want to just leave people and say, we're done with the ritual, okay, we're done. There's always a, then needing time for people's reflections and processing and having an opportunity to share if they want um, what, what, what the experience was for them. So, okay. So with the seventh generation, this is a ritual where we are stepping into deep time. And I'm gonna talk um, in more detail about what, what that is in, in work that reconnects lingo. But we're, we're, this is a ritual where we are moving forward 200 years into the future with this magical opportunity to talk with our ancestors who are alive in 2023, this time of the great turning. So this would be like if we today had the opportunity to talk with people who are alive in 1823 and be able to actually have dialogue and conversation. So one of the, the key pieces of allowing this to happen is stepping into the place of our imagination, okay? And imagination, um, is often seen as something that's, it's make-believe, it's made up, it's not real. But in fact, imagination is vital, essential for change, for creativity, for invention, for um, experiencing new things. Imagination is a field that is very alive and vibrant. 
right? That um, anything that was um, invented existed first in a person's imagination, right? So this is the place of infinite possibility. And it actually is, has its own energy. So we need to be able to imagine um, the world that we're dreaming into being in order to be able to move forward in that direction. So a book um, that I'm highly recommending um, is uh, a book by Rob Hopkins called From What Is to What If. And it is a beautiful book on, um, uh, that talks about the power of imagination. And not only is it um, about how important it is for us in here to be in our imagination in that place of play, uh, it is also vital that we, act, that we have opportunities to experience what we're imagining. So one example that he gives in the book, there was a, a community in England and they wanted, um, there was a group that wanted to create a downtown where there were no cars, no buses, that it was just a walking space. And all of the powers that be said, no, 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 we can't do it. But this group said, well, then let's do it for a weekend. Have it be like a festival. And they got permission to do that. And so the people in the community got to step into and actually experience what it would be like to have a downtown with no cars, no buses. And that energy being in the space of what if totally changed people's perception and their, their ability to think creatively about maybe this actually could happen. And things began to shift in that community. So it's important that in our sense of imagination and ritual in play, that we're providing space for us to embody a possibility, a future that we're dreaming about, mm -hmm. even for a short amount of time, because it starts to change um, our brains. It can change our, our, our heart space and that, that beautiful place of creativity of what's possible. I find it interesting um, that in um, learning more about trauma and, and stress, that the part of our brain, the hippocampus, where our imagination and creativity lives, um, gets our ability to imagine um, decreases as our stress levels, our sense of, of not being safe, our being in that space of trauma increases. And so they talk about people who are, um, in severe places of addiction or in trauma, they've lost the ability to imagine a, any kind of future other than what they're in at the moment. So creating ritual space or other places where we are imagining and playing and trying out something new is vital for our resilience, for our creativity, for healing from trauma and stress, um, and so this is the part of the, the real gift of the seventh generation ritual is that we are providing an opportunity for 30, 40 minutes where the great turning has happened. We figured it out. We don't have all the details, but we figured it out. And we as facilitators need to fully embrace that new world that this place of play and imagination have it be real for us so it can be real for the people coming into this ritual the more that we can feel comfortable and embody it and own it the, the more powerful this ritual will be and we're giving people permission to follow that lead so this is um yeah, this is the, the magic really of, of this ritual. Where we're going into what is called deep time and deep time um, is a beautiful, um, one of the deeper teachings within the work that reconnects. So I'd like to spend just a short bit of time um, inviting you into an, an understanding of deep time and, and the importance of it within the work that reconnects and for this ritual in particular. So when we talk about deep time, 
um, it's within this context of our current Western understanding of time, which is fairly li is linear, right? There's the past, the present is now, and then there's the future. Being in the present moment as a practice is really powerful and impactful and important. But when we start to make decisions based totally on the present moment or very short term, um, we know that this can cause, um, is contributing to the, to the great unraveling to our sense of um, having no, um, no concern for what's, what's happening in the future. So linear time has its limitations. But if we can start to see time in a different way, with more long-term, we have what's called this expanded sense of time or deep time. And so here, if you can imagine ourselves in the center, the present moment is the center. And we are informed and surrounded by our past and all that's gone before. But there's also an equal field of experience yet to be had that is this future space. Mm -hmm. And deep time then allows us in our space of imagination to travel to these different dimensions that surround our present moment, to engage with our ancestors in the past and to engage with those in the future who have yet to be born. So part of the sense of deep time is having an awareness of our evolutionary being, recognizing that everything from the Big Bang onward all the many stages of life's development on earth reside in our body. So we are a product of this great evolutionary adventure. And there are other rituals in the work that reconnects that allow us to have an experience of this, of our um, ancestral time. At least here, I know in the United States, people have become fascinated with our human ancestry, discovering our roots and where we're from. But in deep time, we also have that awareness that we, through our imagination and intention, can step into the space outside of time and connect to the wisdom of our ancestors and with asking them to support and guide us. And we have all kinds of ex rich experience here. I love this ancestral mathematics that says in order for us to be born 12 generations ago, there are over 4,094 direct ancestors. And that's just going back 12 generations. So just imagine all that life experience and that is already residing within our DNA. But deep time also calls us into a relationship with the future ones. The great turning is calling us into um, a place of imagining and bringing forth a world that is sustainable, just, equitable, and regenerative. And this presupposes that life continues into the future, well beyond our own lifetime. And so we need to focus on the impacts of our actions um, for those who haven't yet been born. And so this idea of seven generations. Um, is a gift that has been given, shared um, with the world from the people of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in North America. And these are the people of the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondagas, Cayugas, and the Seneca. And as a part of their everyday decision-making, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy considers the impact of decisions on the people alive today and those people alive who will be alive 200 years into the future or seven generations out. And so this truly is um, a, a process of engaging with the future ones in present time because their needs are just as important to these people as those who are alive today. And this is um, the inspiration for the name for our seventh generation ritual. Um, that we're here today. And so uh, when we bring this idea of seven generations into deep time, we create that space to invite the future ones to be with us, is, which is what we'll be doing in this ritual, and to actually communicate with us and provide us with inspiration and guidance. 
And just briefly, this, um, it was this deep desire to seek guidance from the future that inspired Joanna Macy and others um, as part of a study group, study action group many years ago to actually start exploring what we now call deep time. And so just a bit of a brief history and then we'll get into our ritual. The work that reconnects started as despair and personal power in the nuclear age. Joanna was deeply concerned about the um, impact of nuclear war and real with the realization that we have developed technology that could basically destroy the planet. And so this led her into creating the first steps in the work that reconnects process. And her exploration into deep time also has nuclear roots because she realized that the radioactive waste created by nuclear power and nuclear weapons will remain deadly for over 240,000 years. And the question came up, how do we warn and protect the future ones about this crazy waste that we're continuing to make? And so she started doing, they started doing journeys and um, ritual to go into um, this time outside of time to ask the future ones, how can we protect you from this waste? And in fact, through that process, um, they came up, um, this future one spoke to them and gave them guidance for what is now called nuclear guardianship. And we'll send links out if you want to learn more about that. That's not what this workshop is about. But I think it's important for us to understand that this process of talking to the future has real life consequences and impact in bringing about change and wisdom. And it's very much a part of the work that reconnects um, and this pro our understanding and exploration of deep time, which leads us into this beautiful knowing that we are the ancestors of the future and what we, now, what we do now will definitely have an impact. So I'd like to, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions after our ritual, but I wanna check in and see, is there a burning question um, that somebody has that you need to ask now based on what I've shared so far that we need to answer in order for you to be able to keep participating? Is there a burning uh, I question? Wasn't really, I didn't really understand the deep time uh, and how it, how it can like, Something about helping me dream of the future generations or communicate with them, or I didn't really get it. Can you repeat that? So our awareness of deep time, it's a, an invitation to step into that space of imagination, to be able to um, invite the beings of the future to be in communication with us. We're gonna experience that in this ritual itself. And so that may be more helpful. Um, I think let's go through the ritual and have that experience. And then if there's still some, some um, I think it's, it's something we really wanna experience. And so we're setting the intention. So imagine that you could talk to somebody 200 years in, in, um, in the past. We're gonna create that opportunity to talk with somebody, to be and embody somebody 200 years in the future. Okay. Kathleen, do you, you see the question about the PowerPoint in the chat? I did not. Um, I do, if I have enough time, um, so in, in the, um, when I do um, online workshops, um, in the work that reconnects, I do use this um, PowerPoint um, to set up and explain deep time. Mm -hmm. Andy. Yeah, I'm assuming that we're assuming that the great ramp, the great turning actually happened. Um, that we're not we can't project into a future where things actually didn't come together. That's, it's a kind of imagination of a future where it actually took place, yeah? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes, and there will be, um, um, there are a number of assumptions that we'll talk about um, that go, that we all, um, you're invited to agree on for the moment to, for the ritual to work.
Lovely. So I'd like to um, shift from the teaching piece um, into um, step getting ready to step into ritual space. And so again, another um, beautiful practice to do to bring our, our attention in to open up the space um, for deep time is to do the invocation um, of the beings of the three times. And so I'm gonna invite us into this experience. So this is a, there's a chant that if you're in a place where you can chant, um, the words are in the chat here. We, we, we use this chant three times. Um, we, we sing it three times um, before each invocation. Okay, so I'm going to invite you to, oh, again, take a breath. In this moment, in this space. And we're going to open up the energies um, in our ritual space to call in all the beings of the three times. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Be with us now, all you who have gone before. You are ancestors and teachers. You who walked and loved and faithfully tended this earth. Be present to us now that we may carry on the legacy you bequeathed us. Aloud and silently in our hearts, we say your names and see your faces. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. All you with whom we live and work on this endangered planet, be with us now. Fellow humans and siblings of other species, open us to our collective will and wisdom. Aloud and silently we say your names and picture your faces. Gather with us now in the hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. You who will come after us on this earth, be with us now. It is for your sakes too that we work to heal our world. We cannot picture your faces or say your names. You have none yet, but we could feel the reality of your claim on life. It helps us to be faithful in the work that must be done so that there will be for you, as there was for our ancestors, blue sky, fruitful land, clear waters. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. Gather with us now in this hour. Join with us now in this place. So now we come to the instruction. Uh, 
this ritual of course was originally designed to be done in person um, and I think we will talk about what that looks like afterwards. I would like you to experience this online um, as we're going to offer it here. And then we will talk more about how we would do this in person after. So I welcome you into this place of the seventh generation ritual. Here we have an opportunity to move into that space of deep time and to go 200 years into the future. 200 years into the future till 2223 and have an opportunity to speak with our ancestors alive in this time of 2023, the time of the great turning. Now this would be like if right now we were able to go back in time and speak with people in 1823. They couldn't even imagine this world that we're in now. And we, in 2023, in some ways cannot imagine what the world will be like in 200 years in the future. But for this ritual to work and for us to have this experience, there are some assumptions that we're going to make and that I invite you to make, even if you don't believe them in your heart. If this is something that you would like to believe is true, that's what we're inviting ourselves into in this place of imagination. So the assumptions are these. There are humans alive 200 years into the future. We also make the assumption that the great turning has happened. That we don't know what the steps are to get there. We don't know how many of our brother sister species have made it with us, how many different cultures have made it to this time. But we know that we as humanity have figured out how to live justly, sustainably, equitably with all the beings, human and non-human, that are alive in 200 years in the future. The other assumption is that we have a historic um, knowing and remembering of this time. So we didn't lose any of that connection of history. So we are aware of what's going on in 2023. And the most fun assumption, I guess, or the most creative assumption perhaps, is that there's actually this opportunity where the veil is thin, where the, the time-space continuum um, is altered so that we have the opportunity to speak with people alive in 2023. So these are the assumptions that we all are going to make for this ritual to work. Okay. And we are going to, um, a third of us are going to be future beings. So future beings are those who are alive in 2223. And then two thirds of us are going to be ourselves in this time. We are going to do this ritual. We're going to start it off all together, but then we're going to go into breakout rooms. And there are going to be three or four people in each breakout room. One person in each breakout room is going to be the future being. There are going to be three questions that the future being is going to ask of their ancestors. I'm, um, th those questions are going to come through my voice through the breakout room. So I'm going to be the voice for all of the future beings. Um, future beings, we're also going to um, give you access to a Google Doc that have the questions in it. If, if for some weird reason you can't hear my voice, we're going to, um, should we do a test, Joe, or just trust that it's going to work? We can do a test. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, so uh, right before we actually go into the ritual, we'll do the test. Let me finish right. with the questions. So, um, so there are going to be three questions. And so the future being is going to ask the question through my voice. You'll hear it through my voice. And then the two ancestors, you will have an opportunity to answer that question. Each question will be timed. There are going to be six minutes for, for each question. We're going to send you a message that says you have three minutes remaining. And then we'll let you know when it's time to finish. And then you'll hear my You'll hear a bell and then you're going to hear my voice again. 
for the second question. So there are a total of three questions that the ancestors will answer. In this time, the future being, you are listening to what's being said. You're not asking questions. They're not asking questions of you. They are answering the question that is posed. If there is a, a long pause and the ancestors um, may need some assistance, you as a future being can rephrase the question or ask, is there anything more you'd like to say? Um, but oftentimes when there's a lull in the conversation, someone else is gonna pick something up and, and share. Okay, so really the future one, our job is to listen to what the ancestors are saying to us. After the third question, the future ones, you will have an opportunity to reflect back what is to reflect what, what you've heard from your ancestors and to be able to share what's ever on your heart. What is it that you want to say to them, knowing um, that the world that we're living in um, is happening because of the work and the ways the people are living back in 2023. So you will have an opportunity to share with your ancestors before they go back into the time of the great turning. Okay. So are there, um, and we are going to let you know who is the future being in each group. If you choose not to be a future being, you're going to raise your hand when you hear your name. If you don't want to be a future being, and we will, um, uh, Joe will, will invite somebody else in your group to be a future being. Okay. Are there Questions. Yeah, Joe, is there questions? Or Do you want me to paste the, that list in the chat right now? Um, oh, you've got it as a list. Great. Let's mm -hmm. see. Um, yes, why don't you go ahead and paste that in the chat? Great. Um, and so we're going to, um, we, in order for this ritual to go smoothly, it's really nice that we know that we have, um, uh, that everyone in their breakout room has what they need. So we are going to post a link to a Google Doc um, for all the future beings to have access to in case for some weird reason you can't hear my voice, but we're also just going to go do a test right now to make sure that everyone can hear my voice in the breakout room. Um, so this is, again, going to be a test. We're going to invite you into your breakout room. I'm going to say hello. And then when you see the message to leave your breakout room, come right back, because this is just a test. Yes. Sorry, I'm not real clear on what the future being does. I got kind of confused in that process. So the, for, um, the first three questions, um, okay. I'm going to be asking the question on your behalf, and you are listening to the okay. ancestors. And then there'll be a, another prompt where, again, I'll speak and in, invite you into a time of sharing, reflecting back to your ancestors what you'd like to say to them. Great. Thank and you. Future ones have one opportunity to speak. Okay. Um, do the ancestors answer each of the questions or take it in turn? Um, yes, both ancestors um, will answer the question, and you can go back and forth. Um, with the time, again, there's six minutes total for each question. We will give you a prompt that tells you three minutes are remaining. So you'll know that if, if the second person hasn't shared by the time you see three minutes, it's time to switch and let the other person share. But often what happens is that the ancestors will each take a turn sharing and then maybe add something in. So you'll, um, that's will be, um, we want, we're not going to time that as far as person A, person B speak, just to give you a sense of time. Okay. Any other questions? Great. So then let's just do a quick sound test. Um, so go into your room and we'll see if you can hear my voice. So wanting to see if you can hear my voice. Thank you. I can hear. Yes, go ahead. And uh, this is the, so this is part of the excite, exciting part of doing this online. Um, but once we get everything, um, this is the most techie 
of the rituals that we do online. And uh, once we get that straightened out, it goes really smoothly, actually. So, but, and that's also why we want to get all the um, specifics out of the way before we step into ritual space. Uh, hi, uh, Kathleen, I'm just a bit confused about how it's going to work with your voice and the document, or are we just going to use one or the other? No, you're going, you're going to hear my voice. The document is a backup. If, in, if for oh, some okay. reason, you know, some reason something goes wrong, which mm -hmm. sometimes it does, and you can't hear my voice, then you have access to the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so okay. it's just simply okay. for backup. Okay. So, so the future beings are not actually saying anything. You're saying it for us. I'm saying the no. questions for you. At the very end, you'll have an opportunity to speak. Um, ah. At the very end. Yes, but okay. you, but you, you are not going to be asking the questions. I'll, I'll be asking okay. questions on your behalf. Yes, Jean. So just to be clear, as a future being, all I am doing is reflecting back what I'm hearing the ancestors say. Is that what I'm doing? It's, you're going to be doing more than that. You're going to be um, listening to them and then what you'll be connecting to what is it that you're really feeling, um, knowing that these people um, have they're going they're go they're a part of this great turning that has allowed and helped to create the world that we're living in and so you may find that you want to be offer them encouragement or gratitude or see what comes up on your heart from from what you hear from them okay, <laughs> okay. all right so let's take a breath and we are now going to travel through time. We are moving from 2023 to 2223. So I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable and get ready to step into that space of imagination and deep time. As we move from 2023 So greetings, my friends. We who are alive here in 2223 have the most amazing opportunity today, where through some bit of magic that we have a, an opportunity where the veil is thin where we can actually have communication back in time, 200 years, imagine that, 200 years to talk with our ancestors who are alive in the time of the great turning. That most challenging of times in our history that has led to the world that we now live in today. And so we have the most amazing gift of having this short window of time to talk with some of our ancestors. And so I'm going to invite us into smaller council rooms now where we will be able to greet these ancestors, learn from them, and be able to share a little bit with them in this great gift of time. So as you move into your smaller council spaces, greet your ancestor and then we will um, be able to ask these questions of them. So I welcome you now into these smaller spaces to greet these amazing ancestors.
ancestors, I greet you. All our lives, we have heard stories about the time that you are living in. Some of the things we've heard, we find hard to believe. They say that in your time, a very few people own most of the world's wealth while billions of people go hungry. They say that people and animals everywhere are victims of violence in many forms, and that authoritarian beliefs are gaining ground around the world. They say that colonialization, oppression, and genocide continue to plague your societies. They tell us that animals and plants are going extinct and that climate change is threatening all life on earth. What is it like for you living in this time? Ancestors, please let us know, what is it like for you living in this time? I'll begin. Um, yeah, my name's Anna Hart. Um, it's really scary. Um, I feel a lot of grief for the loss, the losses, the loss that's already happened of extinct species and the, the loss that's coming. You know, there's no, there's no end in sight in one way. I mean, of course, there's so much resilience and courage and joy as well, but yeah, I feel a lot of sorrow about the loss and a lot, the continued loss of species, of ecosystems. And then in the human world, there's so much pain and fear and violence and injustice and it just feels so heavy and so much to carry at times. Mm. My name's Ethan. I would uh, echo a bit of what Anna Hunt had to say. It is, there's a lot of grief. Um, there's fear. Um, I have anger at times um, around, um, I, I suppose in particular around some of our our leadership uh, in government and corporations and things like that that just continue to kind of ignore um, the realities that we're facing. Um, as a as a father of four, I worry quite a bit for the future for my children um, and for their children. Although um, my children are all young adults at this point, um, ranging from like eighteen to twenty two right now, and there's not a one of them that's even sure at this point that they want to have children um, because they don't know that they want to put their children through what's coming um and that's and i understand that and yet it's heartbreaking um to think that way um i'm carry a lot of grief and anger for the ecosystems that are being destroyed the more than human kin that so many of us in our time failed to recognize as kin and um, that we that fail to see the interconnection and the sacramental nature of all beings. Um, and it's sad to see. And I'm, for myself, I'm trying to engage in as many practices as I can to help move the world forward in a better way and in a more reciprocal nature in my community. And um, I'm in an eco ministry certificate program and um, certainly trying to educate my children and people around me 
in order to hopefully have a future for for humanity and for as many beings as possible moving forward. Thank you. Hmm. Is there more that you'd like to share on that? I also, um, I just feel frustrated. It, it's in one way, it doesn't feel so hard to shift the paradigm, but in another way, it just feels like incredibly difficult. Like, um, it just seems deeply natural to care for the planet, deeply natural to care for each other. And yet humanity is so distorted that yeah, we're not caring for each other and the planet. And it, it's just frustrating. It's just really frustrating. So I feel a lot of anger as well. And um, I think there's a lot of giving away of power too and, and, kind of expecting leaders to do it for us. And I, I feel like I feel frustrated that about the powerlessness and, and not claiming kind of our agency and our, what we can contribute. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I feel particularly, uh, you know, deep emotions around violence as well. Like I think children, the majority of children are violated in some way, you know, they're either in domestic violence or they're in starvation or poverty or so, yeah, it's, there's a lot there. Thank you. I see we need to move up. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Ancestors. When we in my generation find water we can drink and soil that's safe for growing food, when we are able to live together with mutual respect and equality, it is thanks to the work that you and your friends are doing on our behalf. It must have been hard for you, especially at the beginning, to stand up for life on earth and for beings you will never meet, except now in this very rare moment. So what inspired you to start on this path of, of deep caring and action? What were the first steps, some of the first steps that you took? Um. I suppose some of the first steps was maybe just the original understanding um, that all is sacred, that all beings is sacred, that that Mother Earth herself is sacred, um, and understanding, coming to understand that everything is connected in inexplicable ways and that um, harm coming to literally anything has an impact potentially a world away that you don't you maybe can't see or understand in that moment but but that it impacts all um on a i suppose on a personal level it was it started with making changes in your the way you live your own life. Um, you know, um, simple things like um, making sure all the all the light bulbs in your home were high efficiency LED bulbs that used very little electricity. It was in our household we made a decision to install solar panels uh, on our home to collect electricity and energy from the sun to help um, help decrease our need for 
um, energy from unhealthy sources from fossil fuels. It was making a conscious effort to uh, buy local as much as possible and to buy what we need and to stop buying into the myth of consumerism and progress. Um, it was beginning to expand what we had originally had as a garden and really garden for ourselves and grow a lot of our own food. Um, we began to keep chickens um, to harvest our own eggs and actually provide that to some of our family and friends. Um, we started keeping goats and pigs um, on our property that we're blessed to tend. Um, just to try and again, make less of an impact. Um, one of our children actually brought forward a, the, a bunch of information around just how uh, negatively impactful the, in particular, the beef industry is. And we made a collective decision in our household to stop eating beef altogether. Um, so a, a lot of it for us just began with our own household and trying to limit our damage and footprint to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Ethan. That's really inspiring to hear. Um, my first steps personally um, was when I was 20 and I guess I loved nature mainly through bird watching i love bird watching i love nature and i felt really concerned about losing our rainforests and a friend invited me to the melbourne rainforest action group meeting and i went along and there was just 50 people really passionate about protecting rainforests and that just it it really changed my life like it just they were incredibly experienced nonviolent activists. Um, we did Joanna Macy's work. Um, this is 34 years ago for me. <laughs> um, and we did nonviolent direct action and we made a lot of achievements and we particularly highlighted the huge ship that would come into the Melbourne docks, one every six weeks carrying timber from Indonesia, from Sarawak, Indonesia, Malaysia. And we would attempt to blockade it by going into the water in our wetsuits, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, every six weeks we would do this and got incredible media co coverage. We always made it very colourful and dramatic and and I guess it changed my life and just it opened up me to me the possibility of the power of the people. So joining a group and committing and um, we got a ban of the use of rainforest timbers on all building sites throughout our state, which was an incredible success. One of our members was a builder. Um, so it was just very you know, there was a sticker back then, subvert the dominant paradigm. <laughs> and I think all our conversations were, how do we subvert the dominant paradigm? How do we subvert the capitalist, consumerist, passive kind of roles that we're put into? And, and having a tribe, I think finding a tribe, finding community um, and taking action. And yeah, we were all composting and recycling and um growing veggies and um yeah so that was my beginnings <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you mm. but ancestors we know you did not stop with those first steps that you just shared we celebrate you with stories and songs that tell about you and your friends and all that you're doing to leave us a livable world. So where did you find the strength to do this? Where do you, where do you find the power to keep on going? What inspires you despite all of the obstacles and discouragements? 
What keeps you going? I can start. Um, and Anahat, you, you just alluded to it to some degree. I think a big part for me is community, is like-minded people and having a, a community that can help, you know, it's a container to help hold that grief and, and hold the energy and, um, um, for me, that started um, fairly locally. I became involved in, we have a group here that's the Whatcom County um, Multi-Faith Network for Climate Justice. And we do a great deal of work, whether that's ecological restoration or trying to get information out around um, voting for or against various legislation that impacts the environment. Um, it's me going to school with a group of like-minded individuals in an eco-ministry program and starting a wild church um, that I felt like ended up being kind of a big issue and 80% of the world's population identifies as some type of religion or another that we needed to bring that movement of eco-spirituality into, you know, to make use of that, um, the container of religion to try and invoke change. And so, um, and some of that was deepening my understanding of grief, really, that um, grief actually dealt with in a healthy manner deepens soul. Um, one of our contemporaries from our time that's no longer with us, John O'Donohue, said, life is a growth in the art of loss. And so really, you know, not trying to avoid it, but embracing it and befriending it and um, letting it deepen your capacity to love. You, you only grieve what you love. And so... Um, there was some amount of needing to embrace that and and then just try and teach and share with others. And the more people that you share with and can teach and you expand your community and it's that much bigger a container to, to hold and to support one another and to inspire one another and to move forward. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Ethan. I, I love hearing about the wild church. That sounds gorgeous. Um, yeah, what keeps me going? Last weekend, I did a the full spiral journey of the work that reconnects with John Seed. John Seed's an Australian who's worked a lot with Joanna Macy, and uh, it was really incredible. And I really agree, Ethan, about the power of grief and i would say the power of all emotions like the truth mandala that sharing of our emotions and i i feel like my emotional life is a real resource you know whether that's anger or fear or grief or the whole range um um yeah and and tribe and community is so important um I think what else keeps me going is soul based work that I've done in the last four or five years um, with the Purpose Guides Institute and the Animus Valley as well, of kind of this deep sense of knowing my soul self and how I want to serve. It just is such a powerful resource to feel connected to that sort of you know it, it's hard to put into words but that deeper soul self mm -hmm. and i support that connection through creating art and journaling and stream of consciousness writing so a lot of inner kind of connection but then also coming together with other people um there's a group of us who sing earth songs together and um yeah the work that reconnects practices um and what else keeps me going? Just love, just finding ways to 
feel the love for this planet and I've got a son as well so just yeah um and nature wandering nature wandering is a huge thing for me just really really replenishes me to the beauty and the joy of being in nature and this is why I'm doing what I do as well um yeah there's there's lots that keep keeps me going do you want to add anything more Ethan Uh, well, I can certainly echo some of what you're talking about. I mean, as I mentioned in, I think, the first question, I have, I have four kids that will carry on into what's ahead, and that, you know, that certainly feeds me energy to keep on. Um, I would echo the deep soul work. I love Bill Plotkin's work. You mentioned Animus Valley, um, Richard Rohr's work. Um around some of that, some of Joanna Macy's work, obviously, we're here. Um, yeah, it's, and and the connection to the natural world. It's, how can you, I, I don't know how you can't walk out your front door and be grateful for what's been bestowed upon us. So, yeah, thank you. So now you of the seventh generation, it is your turn to talk. You have been listening to the ancestors speak of their experiences of this great turning time. As you listened, thoughts and feelings arose in you. Now is your chance to speak to them. What is in your heart to say to the ones before you? Very soon, these people will be returning right into the midst of the challenges and danger. What would you like to say to them? So ancestors, first and foremost, I want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart and the hearts of others, because I hear in you the struggle and I hear in you the fear and the loss and the great courage that it's taking and the fact that you are um, moving forward with deep love, not knowing the outcome, but here I'm, here I am, in this time. So grateful for all that you kept doing and are will continue to do in your life, and those coming after you will do because the visions that you have, what's in your heart, how you love, what you love, these communities, the natural world, spirituality, creativity. This is all things that nurture us now through your commu com communi your community building, your commitment, your hard work and your broken hearts. You have set the stage, you're building the steps that have allowed us to finally figure out how to live this great turning that you are dreaming about now. So I want to say thank you and to please keep going keep believing in yourselves, keep believing in each other, reaching out to each other, crying together, loving together, laughing together, taking what well, I'd love hearing um, the things that nurture you are, are about being connected to the beauty in the world, to, um, to, to what makes your heart sing, to your spiritual space, to your creative space to your children and how important um, your children are to you. And so know that I can't tell you all the different steps that are gonna go from your time to my time. And there are some circuitous things that happen. Um, you can't know the impact of how you're living your life, except for me to say to you, we're here and we're here because of you. And so if in times of doubt, to know that whatever you're putting out into the universe, following your dreams, what's in your heart, there are so many others of you doing the same thing and that it is making a difference. And it may not make a difference in the time frame that you can see or that you can touch. And things may get worse before they get better. 
but I want you to know that there are there is a, a world here that you can't even imagine, and, and I know that. But to know that the values that are keeping you going are some of the bedrock of the values that we share here now. And that sense of joy and community of um, being being in this beautiful world that there are parts on this planet that are still very beautiful and rich rich connection to all life forms that are here with us now mm -hmm. so i just deep bow deep bow to you and, and i it, it breaks my heart to hear how difficult it is in this time for you and uh and I wish I could reach through time and make it all better, and I can't. Um, but what I can do is um, let you know that it's worth what it's worth it. It's worth what you're doing. Um, if if knowing that there is um, this world that you've bequeathed us, so thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So greetings, ancestors. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to be with you. And so we greet our ancestors. So thankful for this time together. We have a number of questions for you. And so first, ancestor, all of our lives, we have heard stories about the time that you are living in. Some of the things we've heard, we find hard to believe. They say that in your time, a very few people own most of the world's wealth, while billions of people go hungry. They say that the people and animals everywhere are victims of violence in many forms, and that authoritarian beliefs are gaining ground around the world. They say that colonialization, oppression, and genocide continue to plague your societies. They tell us that animals and plants are going extinct and that climate change is threatening all life on Earth. What is it like for you living in this time? Ancestors, I ask that you share with us what it's like for you right now. Thank you, future being, for this opportunity to communicate something of the experience of being alive at this time. It's true, it's a hard time. We see so many changes, so much suffering. Um, it's very, very hard to see life disappearing in all the creatures, the sea becoming sick, oppressive uh, governments creating harder and harder rules for the liberty, uh, threatening the liberty of all the beings around us who are trying to express their desire for change. Oh, just hearing you put that into words to describe what we're living and um, what you have been told is is entirely correct and um, uh, Sana there as well has captured some of the sadness we're living through really difficult times right now and I, I too feel this weight of the the extinction the rate of extinction that we're living through and and as human beings, we don't even have time to realize what we're living through. We don't have time to talk about it. We're living in this age of a great acceleration and we have so little time to really mourn the losses. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so hard. And, and everything that you've named, I feel is what's happening. You, you, have, you have the information correct. Yeah. Yes, Esme is right. It's the the rush all the time 
takes us away from our hearts and uh, makes it so hard to stay connected with what is really important for us. We feel, we feel like we're just struggling to survive and keep up with the masses of information all the time of things collapsing, getting weaker, getting darker around us. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's so disorienting. It's, it, 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 it's really um, a struggle to stay connected with, with what is important in our hearts. I don't know how things are for you, but we are, so many people here are working all the time. Our hours are dedicated to jobs that for many people, they're not connected to their hearts and their passions and, and what they feel called to do. They simply work these jobs that people are doing just to earn money so that they can pay their rent and just keep this cycle of consumption going. And, and, and we're, we're aware of what is happening. It's like we know that things are going in the wrong direction, but it's just so hard to stop and, mm. and just take time to, to really talk about what's happening. There's so few, few spaces to really talk about, yeah, this, the, the water situation, for example, and Diana mentioned there, the, 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 our seas are sick, our rivers are sick, they're contaminated. All of the water that what we need for life is, is dying and the, and the creatures in it dying too. It just feels like a decimation of our ecosystems on a scale that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. and it's so hard. Just, just putting this into words now and is, is quite painful. Mm -hmm. I agree with Esme. It's, uh, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating sometimes to feel this helplessness that things are disappearing around us and we would love to do something and we feel we feel uh, unable to 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 um, launch the massive response that we wish mm. it's a frustration I feel desperate sometimes with this. Yeah, it weighs, it weighs heavy. It weighs heavy on my heart. And um, I feel that we're doing a great disservice to, to the future ones, even just the generation beyond me. As a, as a teacher, teaching very young children, sometimes I feel this weight of what we are really giving for them, what are, we, what are we really preparing them for? Um, I'm not sure that they're ready for what, for what is to come or what I feel is to come. Mm. And what is frightening is that even those who, uh, who, who are conscious that something is wrong, uh, all they talk about is recycling. Sometimes it drives me crazy. <laughs> Ancestors, when we in my generation find water we can drink and soil that's safe for growing food, when we are able to live together with mutual respect and equality, it is thanks to the work you and your friends are doing on our behalf. It must have been hard for you, especially at the beginning, to stand up for life on earth and for beings you will never meet, except in this magic moment right now. What inspired you to start on this path? And what were some of the first steps that you took? Mm. Oh, that's such a, a beautiful question. Um, I think that even from a very young age, I felt very sensitive to to the to nature around me and to want to take care of of this of these trees that are close to me in my in my local park 
taking care of animals feeling uh, in the 1980s we we had a, a big campaign against uh, testing on animals and I do remember that as a very early campaign that I felt very strongly about what we were doing testing our medicines and our even cosmetics on animals and and causing them harm so I feel like that sensitivity has been there for me from from a young age and and as I've gotten older um, I've tried to maybe push back against the acceleration and try to live a slower life maybe try to um, cycle to work rather than have a car for example or walk and make my life um, as coherent as possible how can I cause as least damage as possible how can I use the less fossil fuels if, if something in my life feels like it needs a lot of petroleum for it to happen then I question I, I feel an incoherence and I try to question that um, and so I've had this desire to live a simpler life that maybe doesn't need so much so so many resources in terms of money or or petrol um, so that I can step a little lighter, maybe on this on this earth. That's beautiful, Esme. I I was I think inspired at the beginning by the a fear in a way, but uh, the response to that fear. It was at the publication of the Meadows Report when I realized that the, that we're living at a pace too fast for uh, the resources and that we're treating the earth as if it's limitless resources when it isn't. Mm. And what inspired me was the, the number of people in the streets of London at the time I was 12 years old, uh, grouping together to, to uh, express the, the insanity of this and the necessity for, for for living the kind of life you talk of, Esme. Um, and I was convinced that with people awakening like this, that uh, it would be so easy. All we had to do was adjust, uh, adjust some things at that time and it could have, uh, it could have happened. Um, and then through my life, I've been able to fortunately meet people at just the right time, even when there were lots of uh, twists in the tail since that moment. I'm so grateful to have met those people to, that allow me to express what hurts in my heart and what uh, the vision that I have to, to uh, um, take care of uh, those that are yet to come. I, 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 I have always uh, had it uh, dear in my heart to leave healthy traces behind me and uh, nuclear waste was something that just devastated me and the the vision that we could consider nuclear places as uh, sacred sites is something that is just so inspiring to me. Mm. Mm, so beautiful to hear that. And the, yeah, when we just meet people, you know, I think when we speak the truth that we, or, or that weight that I feel in my heart when I talk about it, I realize that it's actually just, what feels like people don't want to talk about it that's covered up is actually very thin and and just just mentioning and just opening a conversation I realized wow there's so there's such a groundswell of emotion there and and caring I think that sometimes we think that people don't care and people are living this very fast life but I know that they do I know that they do care and it's not even that they care deep down it's it's right there on the surface and just being able to share concern kind of opens opens and, and shifts something and and I'm, I'm living in a country of Colombia that's a biodiverse country it's actually a mega diverse country and it's very inspiring to be here and there's a sense of responsibility 
for all of these more than human creatures that are around me all the time you know it's just such such a diversity of life that I feel called to to protect in some way in some small small way I'm certainly not doing anything heroic but at least the sense is there to to want to take care Ancestors, we know you did not stop with those first steps. We celebrate you with stories and songs that tell about what you and your friends are doing to leave us a livable world. Where do you find the strength to do this? Where do you find the power to keep on going for the sake of life, despite all the obstacles and discouragements? What keeps you going? I feel the support of all life around me. I, I feel a, a deep trust that I'm meeting the 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 right beings at the right moment and what helps me to keep going is uh the incredible resources that come from the connection with other humans but also the animals that i meet the plants and the waters that i meet um i met beings who help me uh uh admit my own desire to 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 hear these all these beings and and to not feel like i was crazy because it's true that in these times uh we can we can be um we can be made to feel crazy for having a vision of a whole world and uh those people who here with open hearts and who encourage are precious so precious oh, i i do feel like sometimes it is hard to keep going and i think that's that is something that i would want to express the the challenge there to to go against what has become for many of us in this more perhaps modern or developed uh, economies that it to go against that requires a kind of consistent pushing and remembering and and being awake to when something doesn't feel feel right and definitely the the people that we can meet can can help remind us that we could there's we're not by ourselves there are other people there that can yeah, as Anna says, kind of like encourage us, you know, to say, yeah, this is this is the way we can do it. And and people who are much further ahead in the journey of, of the great turning. There are so many people who are visionaries and have incredible sustainable thinkers of yeah, farms of like organic food and living in community, um, beautiful projects that are like beacons really for us to 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 kind of take energy from and and inspire us i do feel really inspired by some of the people i've i've met and some of the projects that they are leading in community mm. i agree and i find that it's uh it it, it is hard uh, but there's always there's always another spark uh, of an inspiring project or an inspiring person at just the right moment at many every time when i see something that just makes me want to give up and cry and uh drop down onto the earth uh, um unable to move anymore at, at those times there's always something that comes along uh, it might be an insect it might be a book it might be a, a zoom like this uh, <laughs> a zoom chance to speak with beings from past and future uh, 
it's incredible. It, it opens possibilities every time when, when they seem to be shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Just before they close completely, there's always something that, uh, that appears. And I realize that uh, I'm not at all alone. Because our society wants to make us feel we are alone and not enough, the way it's constructed. Yeah, and I, I think what keeps me going too is like a, a sense of gratitude. If I can have my gratitude practice where I can really go out into nature and and just feel thankful for what for what we do have and what is still here and what is persisting in the face of of these damaging systems that we have created and and recognizing too that it, it's not like a deep down uh, intentional desire to damage you know that it's not like I don't feel like uh, the systems we've created are deliberately designed or or intentionally designed to cause damage it's just like a sort of misguided mechanistic way of thinking where we've become disconnected and therefore very well-intentioned people are are parts of these cogs of damaging machines but sometimes we're not aware and awake to it and it's people working sometimes really hard working really hard with the best of intentions and and perhaps not realizing the 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 impacts of of, of what that work is doing um so, uh, yeah trying not to feel too um sort of judgmental or feeling like that we're that we're all evil beings on this planet i think that that that's not we we are working um sometimes with the best of intentions and and that gives me a little peace. Mm. Thank you. Now we of the seventh generation, it's our turn to talk. You have been listening to ancestors speak of their experiences of the great turning. And as you listened, thoughts and feelings arose in you, I'm sure. So now is your chance to speak to them. What is in your heart to say to those before you now? Very soon, these people will be returning right into the midst of the challenges and dangers of their time. What would you like to say to them? So first of all, thank you. This has been such um, such a privilege and, and a rich experience to really hear and feel um, what, what it's like in your time and to see and to feel the depths of your caring and your love and also to feel the level of, of grief and frustration and um, wanting to um, pound fists or tear hair out or just say, what is going on in our time? Um, I feel that from you too. And I want to say, please, please keep being and doing and growing in the ways that you are. Because even if you can't see the impact of what you're doing in this time, know that you're creating the steps for others to keep to keep moving forward because I'm here to tell you that in this time, the things that are um, meaningful to you, um, community, being out in nature, loving your children, um, being in a space of, um, of deep caring and joy in the same time, th these are the foundations of our time. And so know that what you're doing is making a difference. And I hear that you may never really feel like that's the case. I heard one of you say it wasn't anything heroic um, that I'm doing. And I want to say to you, everything that you're doing is heroic. To be, to be present to what's happening right now and to still find joy in your heart and the ability to care and to do 
and to be and to reach out, that is being heroic and being courageous because um, it, it's about all these small steps that everyone's doing that brings about change. And um, so everything, how you are being, how you're showing up, how you're caring is all about being courageous, being heroes. And so um, thank you. This, I, it's hard to imagine and, and I can't really describe to you this world that we live in now, but I want you to know that it's because of all that's happening now in your time that is creating this foundation for a shift that I know and I'm hearing that you're dreaming of and I, I'm here to tell you it happened. It happened. It's not perfect here in the space. It's not perfect in this world. But oh my goodness, from hearing what you're dealing with now to the reality of this time, I want you, if I, at all possible, can gift you with the belief that everything that you're doing matters. And how you reach out, who you touch, that, that I hear from you that the, how important community is, meeting the right people at the right time. You are those right people in those right times. You are the one who are bringing this, your deep caring out into the world and connecting to others. And again, it's so hard to not be able to see the future and especially in a time where it may get more challenging before the shifts happen but you are building the foundation for this world that is, um, I, I wish I could bring you, I wish I could bring you into this time more than <laughs> this short amount of, of time, um, but know that we are so grateful, truly grateful for how you are in this time. And so I, I offer my deepest gratitude to you. Thank you. Oh, precious. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you. And so my fellow beings of 2223, we're now going to come together um, as one large gathering again to bid farewell to these ancestors and to offer a final bit of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you as we're gathering back in. So inviting um, my fellow beings to take one final look at these beautiful ancestors as we're continuing to come gather back in this space. Take in these courageous beings, these amazing humans. Hmm. And soon we will all be back together. And so ancestors, we have been so great, so gifted by your presence in this amazing magical time. And it is now time as the veil closes to say one more time, our deepest gratitude to each one of you and, and our heartfelt invitation to keep believing in yourself because who you are, how you are showing up in this time is making a difference every single day. And we are proof that that is the case. So we send you off as the veil closes with our most heartfelt gratitude to you. Welcome back to 2023.
If you were a future being, I invite you to stand up or spin around in your chair, do something different to, sort of come, to come back into your body and uh, to be present again for this time that we are in of the great tuning. Mm. To, um, when we do this ritual, you know, in workshop space, we would have then time for reflection on how this was. And so I want to open up that space um, briefly for maybe a few reflections on what was it like to be in the, for being in this ritual. And um, when and so you're sharing, if you would identify if you were yourself or a future being. And uh, great. Um, so Carol. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I, I found it very moving. I was a fu uh, future being. Um, I was, my ancestors blew me away. Um, first I sat with, I heard their pain, uh, their their vulnerability, their, their struggles, but um, their strength came through. Um, their um, their deep connection to to creation and they they they're saying that they didn't have a choice they 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 did what they did uh because of love and their endurance their their commitment um their their being inspired by everyone else who's working with them um uh, they they told me that we're all involved in the great turning so uh, we have a choice either to consciously uh implicate ourselves in it or to 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 not um but the power of love just just came through for me very strongly the love of of all beings and that's what keeps them going Thank you, Carol. Evelyn. Well, I was a uh, I was an ancestor and and speaking with future being Carol. So it's touching to hear Carol's reflections. I I think I did this ritual in two thousand seven or two thousand eight with Jana, and. Um, I have no doubt that then I was feeling despair and desperately seeking empowerment. And I just, it was harder to answer those questions now, you know, it just questions about what is it like to be living in this time? And I just was really struck by that. Um, and so it was very powerful to be able to name those things and to be able to share them and to, to have, um, you know, to hear the the common experiences and and to be able to really reflect on that out loud, which I don't get to do most of the time. So, yeah, thank you, Larissa. Thank you. Um, thank you to the ancestors who were with me in the room, uh, Leanne and Mary Jo. Um, Thank you for this exercise. It was unbelievably powerful. I was um, grounded and held by the space, but quite awash with deep emotion. So um, I just want to say I, I don't give up. Be proud of who you are. We know it's never been easy. And I believe there's a place where we all belong. I stole those words from Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel. I'll put them in the chat. <laughs> Love to all. Thank you, Larissa. Jill. Yeah, also, I, I was from the future and um, want to thank the two women that were with me. Um, I, I found it incredibly uh, but poignant and powerful to be listening, to just be listening. And um, 
And to be hearing how uh, honest and and sometimes vulnerable both people were, and um, it anyway. I think that the what I guess I really want to say is that the power of listening is just as felt just as important as the power of speaking. And it also felt like to go from being in the future to the, to listening to ancestors um, made me feel like how important it is, whatever the future is going to be, to remember, to not forget what happened, because it makes everything that happened that is the great turning even more um, powerful and meaningful. It's not just words. So I, I really, and um, both women, I, I see Sarah there, and I'm looking for the other amazing person who is with me. We don't see right now, but um, we're, we're just so, they had very different experiences from each other, mm -hmm. but we were able to really find what we're, the universal experiences and what were the particular experiences and i felt like that was very valuable also in moving for me and then to be able to say to speak with them and encourage them which someone else just mentioned was felt really amazing also i know i said a lot but it's very hard not to <laughs> thank you jill because right, we'll it was so moving all right, Jean, be our last question or comment yeah. right now. Um, I was also a future being, and I it was pretty amazing how real this felt to me. I, I went into it feeling like uh, I've done this ritual before a number of years ago with Joanna, and but I now I feel like things have gotten worse and how can I really imagine that there will be all these generations? I, my grandchildren are you know, fairly young, and I think they may not choose to have children because of the way the world is. So, But then doing this ritual, uh, there was such... Um, there was such a sense of community that the ancestors expressed and real love. And I felt like, and as a, you know, my role was being in the future. Well, this could be, this actually um, could happen this way if enough people are um, doing, you know, being present with what's really happening and expressing the pain, expressing the grief, and then stepping forward. So it was a, especially that this could happen on Zoom. I was, yeah, it was quite good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So wanting to um, shift our, our conversation now from reactions to participating in the ritual um, to actual to questions and comments about facilitating this ritual. Um, and this the the seventh generation is one of a few uh, rituals in the work that reconnects lexicon that um, can be used as a standalone um, ritual because doing the work that reconnects, is about going through all four stages of the spiral, right? Not just doing one piece of it, but going through the entire spiral. And the seventh generation is one that for the most part does that. We usually, if we're gonna do this as a standalone, uh, will offer a, a gratitude experience in the beginning, open sentences or some other kind of gratitude reflection to really anchor ourselves in that gratitude space um then before moving into the seventh generation uh ritual um and so now that we've experienced it online just a, a to again to do this in person 
um, you actually would pair up um, people, uh, one future being to one ancestor. So wanting to um, shift our, our conversation now from reactions to participating in the ritual um, to actual, to questions and comments about facilitating this ritual. Um, and this, the, the seventh generation is one of a few uh, rituals in the work that reconnects lexicon that um, can be used as a standalone um, ritual because doing the work that reconnects is about going through all four stages of the spiral, right? Not just doing one piece of it, but going through the entire spiral. And the seventh generation is one that for the most part does that we usually, if we're gonna do this as a standalone, uh, will offer a, a gratitude experience in the beginning, open sentences or some other kind of gratitude reflection to really anchor ourselves in that gratitude space um, than before moving into the seventh generation uh, ritual. Um, and so now that we've experienced it online, just a, a to, again, to do this in person, um, you actually would pair up um, people, uh, one future being to one ancestor. And after each question, the future being stands up and finds a different ancestor to, to talk with. And so the, the future beings will get up and move um, two different times. And then when they're with, with the person that they're with for the third question, then they stay there to give their sharing. So that's, and the facilitator is that you, you would hear his or her voice um, as you heard mine, again, being the voice of asking the questions. Uh, so that's the, the one variation in the, in doing this in person. So I'd like to see if there are um, questions from you about um, facilitating this ritual. Uh, so I don't have a drum. <laughs> what, what do I need to move us into the future? Um, are there other ways? And I, as an ancestor, not the future being, I, I felt like I was moving too. And I don't know if I was supposed to be, or if it was just the ancestor was moving and it was quite sad. I felt like I was dying and my children are dying and my grandchildren. <laughs> but anyway, how do I get, how do I facilitate that so it's effective for everyone participating? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, Joanna um, will uh, do a toning. So after all the instruction, people are seated and will tone ah and have everybody tone uh, together and keep that going for a while. Again, with setting that intention of now we are journeying into the future and we're gonna do the ah and then once the ah is completed, then there's the welcoming into the space. Um, and that, that, works, that works really well as, as well. Uh, and in essence, in that sense of moving forward in time, it, we all were, right? In order for somebody to be alive 200 years of the future, in that respect, yeah, we were, we're all gone, but somehow we're magically, they're connecting to us while we're still alive back here. So it's that good part of our imagination and magic for that time. Yeah. And then the same thing for the closing. Then when it's time for the ending, um, everybody tones again to come in. Um, and then that sense of getting up and moving around and shifting out of, especially if you're a future being, um, does help us to, to ground ourselves back in the space. Um, uh, and one thing I wanted to, to mention um, that somebody had said how important the listening is. Um, and so that's part of holding the container of the ritual. Um, in Zoom, it's harder to do because you can't read the, the, the breakout rooms. But that's why it's really important to give the instruction up front that the future beings really are here to listen until it's time to speak. When you're, when you're facilitating this in person, you can, of course, can always check and see if a future being's cheating and, you know, go tap them on, tap them on the shoulder and, uh, and you know, and give them some guidance. Um, 
Yeah. Yes, Emma. Um, Bulavanaka, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, just on that question of the listener, um, uh, if the ancestor has got to the end of their uh, comment and there's like a burning follow-up, is the future being allowed or what have you to ask just a follow-up, not a statement or a judgment, anything? But just to keep the ball kind of with, you know what I'm asking. Yeah. Yes. Thank yes. you. So actually, I'll give you two answers to that. So one, having that space of a pause can be uncomfortable, right, initially. But what sometimes what happens in that pause is that then the speaker has the opportunity to connect with yet another idea. You know, we're so used to uh, filling, sp filling the space with a comment or a question and not just allowing ourselves to be in the space. So there's a value um, in allowing the space to see if something else is going to come from the ancestor. Now, that said, if you have somebody who it's just clear that they are really having a hard time, they've said just a little bit, um, then to um, reiterate the question, you know, or, you know, to encourage them to share more, or is there, like, is there anything else you'd like to share can be helpful. Um, but initially, I would say it's good to pause and allow that uncomfortable space to see if something else will arise. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, Kathleen, there's a question in the chat from Jenny Lee, and it's, if you were to do in person, would you have participants pair up around a circle in inside now and the outside future? Uh, that was how this ritual was first offered and why it's, its first name in the work was called Double Circle. And they did it that way. So there were circle, the outer circle with future beings, the inner circle was the um, um, present day or the, the ancestors. Um, what we've switched the, um, the prompts for how to do this because um, it, a lot of spaces don't have um, enough room to be in a big circle and have enough space so that you can really hear each other, right? So it's a lovely concept. If you have a really big room and people can space out well, it can be lovely to keep doing it as a circle. Um, but what we found to be more effective is inviting people to line up their chairs either in a north-south direction or an east-west direction. So the future beings are all facing one direction, the ancestors are facing the other and you have chairs spread out throughout your space, but everybody's facing this direction. So it's easy for the future ones to know, oh, I'm the future one, I have to get up and go find somebody else to sit next to. So that's the current guidance for how to do it in person that is in the latest version of coming back to life. Um, Thanks, Kathleen. There's another question in the chat mm -hmm. from Larissa. And sharing on the structure of dyads, I felt great value in having two ancestors in this, a triad. Triads also feel safer to me than dyads. What is the reason, value, wisdom in having dyads in the in-person structure? I love, I love the fact that um, the triads have an added energy to them, and 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 I and I found that to be the case as, as well. And you know, this that's an adaptation to doing this online. Um, and so that's a great question as far as bringing that into doing it in person. There's there's no um, there would be no reason not to. I you could set it up that way. It would just take a little more. It would also depend on how many people you have if they're easily divided by three, but then you could also have a group of four like we did or a pair. Um, so I don't know that there's any inherent um, wisdom or benefit to having it pair up one-to-one. -one. Um, 
the the timing would be different. You know, you wouldn't have. Um, so it's sort of depending on how much time you have, you might want to figure that as well. So, you know, we gave six minutes um, for this so that each ancestor had three minutes. If you're doing it in pairs, um, one, you can you can have a shorter amount of time. So maybe doing four minutes each. Um, so that might help you as far as fitting this into a shorter time frame. Um, it, but it also, you could set it up to do it and in, in have two, I would say, again, have the two ancestors, they don't move in the future, one gets up and moves around. I think that could work really well. Um, the, um, the, the book, um, the, the book with all of the work that reconnects exercises in it um, is called Coming Back to Life. And it's, there's a, a new version out um, written by Joanna Macy and Molly Brown. And also on the Work That Reconnects Network website, we have all these exercises up on the website as well. Yes, Malia. Um, I just had a question about the assumptions. You were very careful to lay them out at the beginning. Um, and I just wondered if occasionally somebody really struggles with those assumptions that humans survive <laughs> and that everyone's peaceful and and loving each other 200 years from now? Yes, and that that is actually one of the reasons why I always uh, give the future beings the option to switch places. And that is not necessarily something that I think is in um, the regular practice of this exercise, but it's something that I found to be really helpful. Um, and, and an example of that, I, I do a lot of anti-nuclear work and I did this workshop with anti-nuclear activists. And one of the women who was assigned to be a future being said, I can't do it. She said, I, I don't believe that there's a future. And so she was herself. The, the beauty in it though, is having gone through the ritual, there was a shift in her. And she said, you know, it was really powerful for you know a half hour to be in the energy of maybe we figured it out. And it, it shifted something in her, not necessarily to the point where she still believes there's a future, but it's, it's made a difference in her life, having mm -hmm. that opportunity to be in the energy of, hey, we figured it out, even for that short amount of time. So I do think that it's helpful to give people the option to switch places. Um, and, and actually, you could do it the other way as well. If somebody is dying to, to be a future being, you know, to, to see if you can swap that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Kyle. Hey, I just wanted to firstly say thank you. Thank you to you all. Um, it's not so much a technical question, but maybe there's an aspect to it. Um, I just felt it was... It was deeply impactful and very powerful and it feels like that hope that can be generated from that place of um, imagining the possibility of a future is like the most radical form of activism in these times and so i wonder i wonder if there is ever the i mean and i guess this is contextual but if you would invite people into that, you know, to recontextualize activism in an exercise such as this, as true activism, you know, begins within ourselves with an envisioning of something as this. And so here's the invitation to exercise that. Would you ever think about um, inviting a group or individuals who might not want to do that into that? Uh, thank you, Kyle. There's, um... Uh, I've designed a, a practice um, that I do in a lot of my in-person workshops. Um, that's that's called dreaming, you know, dreaming in dreaming in a new world, and where uh, we start with a black fabric on the floor, and have all of these different animals in colorful paper cutouts, and the practice is that each person comes and takes one and places it on the black fabric and says, I dream of a world where, and we keep putting in 
um, and just keep going around the room, going around the room until we've, you know, people have put in all their intentions for this world that they'd like to dream into being. Um, and it, it, it is, a, I found that it's, it can be very meaningful um, to have that space and it gets creative, it gets fun um, and it can get silly and very meaningful. Uh, but it's a beautiful, um, you know, it's a beautiful way to, to get some of that energy, you know, that those vision, like you talk about people doing individual visioning boards. It's really important um, for us to know what it is that we're dreaming of and what we're working for as much as what we're fighting against. So Kathleen, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so one of them is from Jenny Lee. So on timing, how long do you allow for a typical standalone workshop to go for, including all the steps in person? So if, if I were to do just, if you're talking just about doing this ritual um, as a standalone, I mean, I think the the minimum length of time um, would be two hours um, you know, for a workshop because you're, you're wanting to set the, set the stage. I mean, things that we didn't do in this workshop, you know, coming up with our group agreements or you know, setting the stage for, for the workshop, doing a little teaching on what is the work that reconnects, um, do the, a teaching on deep time. Um, yeah, so you want to be able to, to build those things into setting the, the, the container for for this. Um, the amount of time, so we took about 40 minutes for this ritual, and you can do it, you can do this ritual in 40 minutes in person as well. Um, so I would say a two hour would be a, a good amount of time um, to do to do this to do this ritual, adding in some a gratitude practice in the beginning and again, setting the stage for talking about the spiral. Um, and this, you could also do this, you know, as a half day um, and adding in some more, adding in some more practices and some uh, other maybe experiences of, there's, there's some, if you want to stay with deep time, there's some beautiful exercises in, in experiencing the gifts of our, of our ancestors. So you could do something from the past and then something from the future. Did that answer the question? And then um, one more question, and um, this is from Mary Jo. Would you use this type of ritual with adolescents? Yes. I, yeah, we are, our young people um, know a lot more than, um, maybe we think they do um, and and having a space to be able to speak their truth um, is really powerful so um, and i've done a num i've done a number of these rituals not this one in particular but the council of all beings um, which we're going to be doing in august um, with freshmen in high school uh, and so I think that with, you know, th with the right support and prep that this could be a very powerful exercise or ritual to do, you know, with teenagers. And just one more comment and question. I assume from what you've said that you could also adapt the questions the future beings asked based on a specific context and challenges. Uh, yes, and I guess I'll say, and, um, and so for tonight, today, I did do an adaptation, especially of question one. Um, the questions in coming back to life are pretty minimal. And so I've, you know, added in more context for um, the social and political issues that we're dealing with now. So I would say in general, especially question one, um, when we're talking about this is what we know about your world and your, your um, the life that you're living, um, that if you have a particular group that's dealing with a particular issue, you might want to add that into question one. Um, and, and so you can tailor, I would say question one is where you can um, certainly add in specific, more specific things for the particular group if you know that there's a, an issue that they're working on. 
But the importance is what are the, the, the messages or the intentions of the questions? And so if you're gonna put it in your own language or your own words, um, that's great because you want it to sound natural coming from you. Um, but the idea is that the first question is evoking what is it like for you living in your time? So that's the, you know, that's the, the, the nugget is these are difficult. We're acknowledging these are difficult times. What's it like for you? The second question is about um, how did you, what were the first steps that you took in the work that you're doing? So however you want to language it, but that's the, that's the nut of that question. And then the third one is really important to stress, um, you know, that um, what did you, what, what, uh, how did you keep going? You know, what inspired you? So certainly adapt the questions to what feels right for you to say, but make sure that you keep the intention of the questions um, because that's the, there's a, a reason why um, you go through those three questions. You know what? And I'm all, yes. Elkis, that is how you pronounce your name from Greece. Hello, Catherine, thank you. And uh, hello to everyone here. Um, uh, facilitation of this, uh, I noticed that there is quite a bit of energy work happening in the journey there and back. I see that you have your beautiful totem item in your drum. Um, would you mind spending a few words uh, on how would you hold energetically that journey, so to speak? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so there are um, a number of ways, and as a facilitator, finding the way that feels natural for you to and you know to bring people into that space is important. Um, traditionally, um, how this um, ritual is opened and closed um, is with toning. Um, so in in person, um, people chanting ah or another another um, syllable. So setting the intention of now we are moving forward um, 200 years and everybody um, has this beautiful chanting. And then when that is completed, the facilitator then welcomes people into, into the future. And the same closing it in that way of a chant. Uh, so, and with, with my experience in, in my shamanic work, the drum um, is a way of, of going on the journey. And so, so that's so I'd like to use the drum in that way, but that is part of what makes sense for me in bringing people forward. So you're wanting to find something that feels good for you where you are uh, and allow the time to invite people to move into the future. Um, and and you know, and it may be that there's a you find that there's a song that does that or you know, something that where you would feel like people want to sing themselves into the future and back. Find something that is is true for you, and that that resonates with you. Yes. Okay. Um. So my question is to do with um with the uh, hard emotions coming up and um, sadness coming up. So when you, as a facilitator, if you see someone really being submerged by their emotion, how do you react? So for example, if there is a you are in a physical space. And you see that in one group, one person is, is, is collapsing with sadness. Do you intervene? Do you let the future being console them? What, um, what, what do you think one should do in terms of you know, caring for people? Right. And I have to say, in my experience of doing this, I've not seen that happen. Um, and that said, um, I think it's important to um, read the space and so if this person um truly is in a place of meltdown and um i think it's important as facilitator and this and this of course would be an in, in-person in space where we'd be seeing this rather than online um that that i would go over and and check on you know check on that person um and get a sense of whether they need assistance or if they need to be in that space i mean for some of us we we you know, everybody processes emotions differently and some people can be very vocal and still um, and still be able to be present. So, you know, I would want to read that 
and, and engage with that person. I would not leave it up to the future being. You know, you as facilitator, um, we, we want to be able to hold that space. And if you have a co-facilitator or somebody who's helping to watch, then you want to go in and check in with that person. Um, but also be aware, again, that we all, we all experience this differently. And so um, wanting to make sure you don't take somebody out of their experience, you know, by intervening too soon. So that's helpful, yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Judith. Yeah, so I might be confusing this ritual. Um, it's been a really long time. It was really um, beautiful. I was just wondering if you ever have them go back and do 200 years backwards as well as 200 years forwards. I have not. Um, and it might be an interesting experience to do. Um, yeah. I think the, the intention again in this ritual is wanting to be able to create and hold that space for people to experience what it will be like to, um, to actually have the great turning happen. Yeah. And so, you know, so you know, that's the, that's the gift of this exercise and, and I, that you wouldn't get us. I mean, there'd be a, a different intention for going back in time, but for this, as far as building some sense of resilience and hope and possibility, um, you know, wanting to go into the future where we made it um, is the is the power of this ritual. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Some of my questions have been answered, so I'll go to something that's, I guess, more um, logistical, which is that if I've experienced this ritual a couple times over the past maybe 15 years in person. And this is the first time I've done it online. And I, I think I'd be much more comfortable facilitating this in person than online. And I'm a, my sense is that um, the, it would be, do you and your um, co-facilitator, I'm not sure what, um, sorry, Joe is, bit, no. is called, but anyway, do you do a dry run? Do you practice together online beforehand? You do all that? Yes, we had, yes, we had we had uh, a tech meeting um, to go over the, the logistics uh, to make sure that um, we were we understood how to, to make this happen. Yes. So the, the planning, especially for online, uh, as you can see, this this ritual, there's a, a lot of, you know, some moving pieces, um, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. getting the messaging into the breakout rooms and that sort of thing and setting. Yeah. Them up. yeah. So it'd be good to be paired with someone who's pretty comfortable technically with that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, Stefano. Yeah, really great to uh, do this with you, Kathleen. Uh, you've coached me through this before, so I've learned some things from you and I want to just test my understanding. One thing is uh, one pitfall in facilitation is that the future being mistakenly begins to talk about what it's like in their world 200 years in the future. That didn't happen in my small group, but I think uh, I learned from you to mention that, you know, future beings talk about what you heard and how you feel. Don't try to describe what it's like 200 years in the future. So that's just a little guardrail. Um, the second thing is I'm curious about in this ritual of the calling in of the ancestors, because uh, I mean, we are the we are the ancestors. Let's see, yeah, we are the ancestors to the future being. So, how crucial is that, or what role does that play, or is that just a general? In doing a ritual container, we always want to have the ancestors there. How is that particular to this? The Invoking the beings of the three times is not a, a necessity to go with the seventh generation. Um, I, I like I like using it um, as a, a way of of and bringing us into a, a sense of connection with deep time. And so deep time is not just the ancestors. I mean, the future ones, the ancestors and having that kind of connection. So it's something that I enjoy doing, but it's not necessarily something that you would have to do to be able to bring people into a seventh generation experience. Right, okay, and a couple other things quickly. Um, I uh, I work with audiences that are more conventional 
And so I think uh, it's important to um, shift the degree of ritualization so that it's a stretch for them, but not alien, you know, not too much. So, you know, whether that, I mean, maybe the drumming, yes or no, the language and so forth. And I wonder what you think about that. Um, uh, about that, I, I would I would caution you into assessing your 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 audience's uh, capacity to step into ritual, and I think that that um, more I would invite you into how comfortable are you leading this, regardless of the people there, because as a facilitator, the more that you embody the reality of the ritual, mm. the more people have the, the, the permission to step in. So I, I would suggest you look at yourself as, as far as saying, how comfortable am I embodying this reality? And I think you'll find that even the most conventional people when led well, can find their way into ritual space. Well said. And the final thing is a small thing. I found that in, in my small group, uh, the other person and I chose to kind of go back and forth a bit. Mm -hmm. And that was really very stimulating. And um, you said it's kind of up to you, but I wonder what you think if doing this again, to kind of recommend that you share the time and go back and forth a bit to encourage, because it, it, uh, to encourage that without mandating it. I, I, I think I did that. And again, I don't know that, you know, invite people to use the space as they need to. Um, I don't like to be too prescriptive, but yes, I think I invited, you know, saying that people could go back and forth and share the time. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello there, everyone. Hi, um, uh, Kathleen, I'm, I'm curious as to your um, uh, thinking about um, uh, about you reading the questions, you you broadcasting the questions versus the future beings actually reading them themselves. So what, what what is what's your thinking? This is the first time uh, that I've done it where I've used my voice to 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 do oh. that. Um, of all the other times I've I've done this, we've had um, you, you I've either posted the questions in chat before we go into the yeah. breakout rooms and so the future beings can see them or have the, you know, have the Google doc. And I, I think, um, actually I'd be curious um, for anyone who's experienced it both ways. And there may be a couple of you on here who've done this with me before um, in another class. And I don't, I don't know. I think there, there can be um, some, a real gift in the small group of the, of the person actually giving voice to the question rather than hearing my voice coming through. Um, and uh, in person, so it's important that in knowing that when we do this in person, um, that the facilitator is the voice of the future ones. Um, and so, uh, but in Zoom, I would say that it could work either way and it may even be more impactful um, for the future being in each group. Is that was that your sense that you did you yeah but yeah that you, that that was my sense my my sense uh, I I I was I was curious as to as to what your thinking was around it so that's really helpful that's really helpful to know that you know this is this is sort of an experiment as well um, yeah my my sense was that um, that I I I wanted to read the questions for the connection because I wanted to connect with my small group and I felt a little bit like. A spare part <laughs> I know it wasn't because I was I was absorbing what they were saying and I was able to feed back what they were saying but I think yeah I think I, I personally would have preferred to read out the questions but but yeah thank you and I, and I appreciate when it's in person it actually makes it makes that you can't have everybody when you yeah yeah it makes sense yes yeah thank you and it's interesting so we're getting um yeah, so I think it's interesting. There's some mixed um, re reactions as a future being. I felt the voice was actually helpful. It brought ease and presence, at least for myself and others. I've also experienced in person uh, with reading the questions themselves, hmm. and it was moving. So I think, yeah, there, there, you know, there's flexibility um, in how you facilitate that piece. 
the other thing that came out of doing this Zoom um, was the Zoom ritual was the people I've heard had feedback saying it's really it was really lovely to be have two ancestors and each ancestor enjoyed hearing from the other. And so doing this in person, I might adjust it and try having two ancestors for each um, future being because there there's been some response that that was also really beneficial. Um, when again, when you do it in person, um, people are in pairs and then the future being after each question stands up and the future beings move around so that they can connect oh, with yeah. your ancestor. Right. And oh. so a future being will have met three ancestors in the process when you do it in person. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, Daniela. Yeah, hello. Thank you. I thought it was very powerful. I just wondered if, um, if you then, if you go through one round, and would you then set it up so that other people would be future beings and others ancestors, or do you just go make one round basically, and that's it? If it if there's a longer workshop. Yes, the, you're, you're always wanting the future being to stay the future being and the ancestors stay the ancestors because there's a, a process that happens for the ancestors of going through those three questions. And so, and, and, and you, can, um, you can make the words, um, you know, adjust the wording as uh, to, to fit more comfortably um, in, your, in your own mouth as far as, you know, doing that. I, um, in these questions, especially question one, I've enhanced that from what's in the book um, and added more um, um, social and geopolitical um, um, languaging in there. And I think we're continuing to, to do that in the work that reconnects networks. So um, you can adjust the wording, but be really clear about the intention of the question. So the first question, we're really wanting people to say, to answer, um, you know, what is it like for you? And then what were your what were your first steps? How did you first get started? And then what inspired you? And so there's a process of that happens in being able to go from this is what it's like to this is how I got started to this is how I'm inspired that is opening for the ancestor to experience. So that's part of the ritual as well. And then to hear from the future is that that final piece. So it's important that people stay in the roles that they start in. And, and not switch back and forth. However, if you've done, this is another thing you can do with people, if, if they've experienced the ritual before, um, I will invite them to, um, to, to be the, uh, the, 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 the part, the person that they weren't before. So if you were an ancestor, if you, if you do this opportunity again, see if you can be a future being because it's a different experience um, being on different sides of it. Thank you. Yes. Carmel and Nadav. Yes. And uh, being that said about the three questions and the uh, unique intention of every question, as I understand, mm -hmm. I think that uh, the wording of the questions are a bit confusing um, because question two talks about inspiration and and it sounds like the focus on question two was actually about uh, what was the first steps. And question three is, all, is, is about this inspiration again. It sounds like also, so I Thank would- Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That is really helpful um, reading of, of the questions. And I agree with you. Um, using inspired twice is not helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the intention of the second question really is about how did you get started? So there, I mean, there is a sense of inspiration, like what, in, what got you started um, in, in your work? Um, and that's really helpful to, um, to, to single out the use of that word twice. Thank you. We'll make yes. sense there. Because I, in my experience, I answered the question twice, kind of. So that's, that's why I said it. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Say any final words, Kathleen, before we close? 
So I just want really grateful to Joe for wonderful tech support and for everybody being here. Um, we've got, we're going to be doing this um, series again for the Truth Mandala in July. And then I will be co-facilitating with Frida and Nixdorf um, in August on doing the Council of All Beings. So I hope you can join us there. And then there will also be some links in the follow-up email um, for some of the, the online work that reconnects workshops um, that I'm continuing to offer. So thank you all so much for, for being here. Thank you so much for joining us today for this Work That Reconnects Network Webinars and Conversation Cafe program event. To learn more about the Work That Reconnects Network and our Webinar and Conversation Cafe program, please visit our website at workthatreconnects.org. We welcome you to become a community member of the Work That Reconnects Network. You can visit our website and click on register to learn more. Thank you so much.